We work to create a world that's free of infectious diseases. We work to make sure that no infectious disease is left unchallenged. We discover, develop, implement and evaluate health solutions. Working alongside the most at-risk communities. Doing so ultimately builds a healthier, safer world for everyone. We are the Kirby Institute. Good afternoon and welcome to the Kirby Institute special International Women's Day seminar. Uh, today's seminar is entitled Dismantling Barriers for a Gender Equal Future. My name is Pro Professor Tony Kelleher and I'm the director of the Kirby Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands from which we are joining this uh, seminar today virtually. I myself am joining from Bidjigal lands where the University of New South Wales Kensington campus is located. And I pay my respects to elders past, present uh, and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today. The Kirby is very proud to celebrate International Women's Day each year. It's an important part of our annual calendar and it allows us to promote and celebrate the work and provide a platform for the voices of our women colleagues in medicine, research, and the broader community. As an institute, we have a strong and explicit commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. While I'm very encouraged by the genuine progress we are making towards equity within our organization, there is still much more to be done, especially with regards to diversity at the leadership levels. While this is a historical deficit that we see across many other areas of medicine, research, and in fact, across society more broadly, we must continue to work towards correcting this deficit, not just to achieve the goal, the, those goals of equality and diversity, but because achieving those goals will result in a more insightful, creative, and effective workplace. It's something that I am deeply committed to, not only as director of the Kirby, but in my roles beyond the Kirby. Today's seminar features women who are leaders in their fields, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing them share their experiences. I am pleased now to hand over to Dr. Tanya Applegate, who will be chairing today's seminar. Over to you, Tanya. Thanks, Tony. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I also would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and, and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. And I'd also like to acknowledge that this land was never ceded, that I'm sitting on here today. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, so thank you everyone. My name is Tanya Applegate and, and thanks for the opportunity to share today's session. It's a very important day in the calendar. Um, so. After having the chance to chat with each of our speakers over the last week, I really feel that the stories that we'll be sharing um, and the messages within these stories really need to be heard by everyone. So for those joining us online, and there are quite a few of us by, by the looks of the numbers, um, please give yourself permission to push that keyboard away, stop pretending to multitask, sit back, relax, and listen to all the stories that need to be heard. And for those at the Kirby, um, many of you might still be in your office, stand up and jump into the seminar room and join your colleagues um, where the session will be um, held online. So the format of this se seminar um, will actually be start off with four presentations. I'll introduce, introduce them briefly now and then a bit more with the bios beginning at the beginning of the, each talk. So then we'll also have... Um, Q&A sessions, um, questions, opportunities, you just tap, tap those in to the Q&A panel and we'll keep an eye on those during, during the talks, but then we'll have a Q&A session at the end with all the um, speakers joining us together. So please um, type them in as you remember them throughout. 
So just quickly, our speakers joining us today, and thank you to everyone for um, having the, making the time. Um, we have Sally Kinray, the Vice President of Medicines Development for Global Health. Uh, we have Associate Professor Kelly, Han uh, Kelly Hanku, Angela Kelly Hanku, sorry, <laughs> Senior Principal Research Fellow at Papua New Guinea Institute for Medical Research, and Sienti Associate Professor and Group Lead of the Global Health Equity and Justice Group at the Kirby Institute. We also have Dr. Adrian Lee Withal, a researcher from the School of Psychology at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. And we have Professor Janaki Amin joining us um, from the Department of Health Sciences at Macquarie University. So, Sally, if you'd like to um, take your camera on and your mute off. <laughs> um, Sally Kinray is Vice President and Project Leader at Medicines Development for Global Health, which is a unique non-profit biopharmaceutical company developing medicines for underserved populations. So Sally has a strong background in clinical trials operations and medical affairs with over, for over more than 30 years. She's currently focused on the challenge of enabling access to new treatments um, for onchoriasis <laughs> and lymphatic Filariasis. So I'm sorry if I um, mispronounced the first one there, Sally, but please, um, look very much looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Tanya. And uh, onchocerciasis isn't an easy word to um, get your mouth around, and I, I had to, plenty of time to um, practice, practice that. I'd just like to start by um, thanking the Kirby Institute for this opportunity, and as a, a Melbourne-based team member to acknowledge um, on behalf of Medicines Development for Global Health the uh, Yalakut Willems people of the Boon Wurrung Nation, the first peoples of this country on where our head office sits. Um, we repay, um, pay our respects to all Australia's first peoples and their ancestors and elders. Um, look, I'd like to take the opportunity today to reflect a little bit on my, um, my professional career in um, particularly in the clinical research space. I thought I'd spend some time just uh, reflecting on clinical trials over the last 30 years and the things that I've observed regarding uh, women's participation in clinical studies, and particularly more recently as it applies to working in um, uh, clinical trials in Africa and in other, other places, uh, not Australia. So the first 20 years of my career was really focused on Australian clinical studies, but it's interesting because back in uh, the 1990s, uh, there was a focus on trying to improve the um, participation of women in clinical studies, um, particularly uh, not just women, but women of cultural and linguistic diversity was a big focus back in those times and into the early 2000s. And I remember back then uh, there was a particular um, interest on getting women involved in phase one studies. We had a phase one unit where I was working previously and um, and it, traditionally phase one studies were undertaken by men and men only. I think there was a concern of uh, and certainly a reasonable concern that women shouldn't participate in early stage studies because they uh, would in fact um, they have reproductive potential reproductive consequences for their participation. However, it's been recognized that with careful consideration of those things that there are some uh, medicines and certainly some, uh, uh, clinical studies, even in the earlier stages, that based on what we know about the medicine by the time it gets to clinical trials, having been through animal studies and the like, that it would be very reasonable and appropriate for women to participate. Um, and it particularly, I, I think now that we have a, a phase one study that was conducted with the medicine I'm working on, moxidectin, which is being developed for global health use, where a, um, a lactation study was actually undertaken for uh, in women way back then, and it was very appropriate that they they participate in that and that they should be encouraged to do so. Certainly, um, subsequent um, stages of clinical studies should involve women because we are approximately half of the population and it is important that particularly where um, it affects uh, women as much as men or possibly more than men in those diseases, they should be represented according to the effect um, those diseases have on on women and for infectious diseases mostly it's a it's a it's a gender balance and we should be uh, should be moving towards uh, making sure that women do participate I think in the early stages of working to uh, improve um, cultural and linguistic diverse um, populations in our studies 
the educational materials that we've been producing were very much focused on um, English speaking people, uh, not recognising the cultural differences and the, um, the need for culturally appropriate educational materials. And we started to work more on that, um, certainly making sure that it wasn't just a case of bringing a, um, a translator at the time and have someone read the English version and try to, to um, help people um, understand what was going on, but, but also to actually um, put, uh, put out information not only in informed consent forms, but in, in, in uh, trying to attract people through um, uh, uh, posters and um, outreach through newspapers and um, cultural radio stations to try and explain about the, um, the potential for clinical studies and, and to try and develop interest in people who, uh, who would otherwise not have considered even participating. I think... Um, Similar barriers exist for women in global health settings to those that we've experienced in the past. And often they are layers of family, um, cultural and religious overlays that we have to get to understand in order to help to peel away uh, and to work towards um, um, bringing women on board to participate in studies. In, the, in some of those family settings that we're seeing now, uh, often it's the head of the family who's usually male, makes the decisions on the health care of the, of the family participants. And if a clinical trial is, is something that is being offered in the region where they are, then they will make a decision about that. But they don't make it in isolation. They actually look to their cultural leaders and their religious leaders in the, in the community in order to understand whether a clinical trial is an appropriate um, setting for uh, undertaking uh, for people to participate in in their communities. And so what I've learned along the way now working in the global health space is that we have to bring along everybody on the journey. And so in um, the outreach components, we work towards uh, informing, informing the local leaders and the local um, community leaders are brought together to have a discussion, have all their questions answered, uh, to make sure that they are on board with a clinical trial that may be proposed for the area in which um, in which they live, and that in order for the for families and then individual members to take on board participation, it's important that we work through all those layers. And where we're trying to attract women uh, as well as men to participate in studies, we have to address some particular concerns. And one of those is often I find um, contraception comes up as a potential barrier to women participating in clinical studies. Typically before you have an approved medicine, it's often uh, it's the usual approach that women should not become pregnant while they are on this on the clinical trials, and so there's an, a lot of question around whether or not contraception should be uh, uh, offered, and why why is it being required, and is there a problem with your medicine and such like, and so having to explain very carefully to the community as to why it is usual uh, in with a, a new medicine that hasn't been registered, uh, why that's important. And as I mentioned, often it's the head of the household who may make the decision um, about a woman's participation because she, uh, uh, because that's his role in the family and she looks to him, but if he doesn't uh, get on board with the idea of his partner taking, uh, taking contraception, then that may be a barrier to her participating. And she won't always have the autonomy to make that decision on her own behalf. I think also that we've had a very recently we've been running a clinical study in um, children and adolescents and and actually we've required that the adolescent girls who who are post menstrual um, post menses that at commencement actually take uh, um, contraception and it was one of the tough decisions that we talked about a lot about how we're going to communicate that and how would it be perceived by a family where a young girl is theoretically not sexually active, but we're asking for consideration of contraception in that, uh, in that setting, and that can be quite a difficult conversation to have. In fact, in that study, one of the four adolescent girls that participated was, in fact, uh, did use contraception. Others um, um, uh, uh, said they would um, abstain. Abstinence was assured. Um, but a lot of that conversation had to be had by the study team. And I think it is what made it um, possible to have those conversations was that the investigator had a very long history with the community. He had gained their trust. 
He had explained and shown the benefits of clinical trial participation and, um, and, and therefore had brought along both the community, the families, the parents, as well as the girls and then children as well um, to participate in that trial. I don't think you can do it without everyone in a community coming on board. And I think some of those, um, you know, education and information in culturally appropriate formats, um, particularly in discussions, in answering questions, in showing pictures, in demonstrating um, the potential uh, benefits to the community of participation is an important aspect that we've learned about. And I guess the last thing to say is that outreach with clinical studies, rather than expecting people to come into a clinical trial is probably um, one of the most important um, ways to provide access to women participating in clinical studies. So having study teams go out to where the people live rather than um, having people to have to come into clinics, which can be barriers to people's um, um, ability to, to participate, whether it's distance, cost, um, being afraid of what might be on the, um, you know, in, in, in the clinic when they've never really had much to do with a clinic uh, is important, um, you know, sort of white coat sy syndrome, I think. Uh, and just a general um, thoughts from there that may um, be built on by the subsequent speakers. I think in access to medicines and vaccines more generally, uh, there are um, there are still barriers to women in our country uh, around um, whether or not they can or should have treatment. Um, recently, there was um, some discussion about um, cost of um, new oral contraceptive pill as compared to the old ones uh, was, was raised as a, as a barrier to women actually getting an optimal treatment. Um, education in schools can be a barrier if the education is different to boys and girls uh, and that they learn about some things and not others. And so when they come to accessing healthcare in general and perhaps medicines in, in, um, uh, in specifically, that can be uh, something that um, may mean that they do or don't get on board with it. And I'm thinking now of the example of um, uh, the vaccination for um, HPV. So you know, there was a justification for why women should get it because it would protect them from the uh, later effects of cancer. But there was, uh, it's it's often difficult to sell those concepts to why should the boys have it, um, can't see the point, and those types of things. And it's actually a, a community decision about how you how you uh, um, implement something if most effectively. I think uh, lastly. I'd just like to say that as women working in the uh, infectious diseases and clinical trial space and uh, so forth, we are in a unique position in the biomedical world where there are, are a lot of women, which is fantastic compared to perhaps some other um, uh, industries and other um, professions, that we have a unique uh, possibility to um, demonstrate by leading uh, and to encourage leadership in women uh, from women in the places that we work. And so getting them involved and having leadership roles within clinical studies in those places, as well as um, perhaps acknowledging their work through uh, involvement in publications or other activities is something that we should con be considering all the time about how do we make sure that women are equal participants in, uh, in all stages of undertaking clinical trials and in accessing medicines wherever we can. So I'll just leave it there and uh, pass back to Tanya. Sally, thank you so much for that. Um, incredible introduction to some of the, touching on many of the themes that we're hoping that we might um, be able to discuss later on in the Q&A session. I, I already can feel there's lots of um, strengths in what you've said that we can, um, that will apply to the other presentations coming up. So now I would just like to um, introduce our second speaker. So Associate Professor Angela kelly Henku. Um, as I mentioned before, she's a Senior Principal Research Fellow in the Sexual and Reproductive Health Unit at the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research, and also a Cianti Associate Professor here at the Kirby Institute. She has a background in the social sciences and public health, 
and works at the intersection between culture, sexuality, gender, health, and well-being. With colleagues, she's undertaken pioneering qualitative and participatory work research at Papua New Guinea on a range of sexual, reproductive, and maternal health issues. Angela is committed to working in a collaborative and empowering way with the communities she serves and in her research, most notably young people, people living with HIV, people who sell and exchange sex, sexually diverse men and transgender people. So Angela, welcome to the panel. Um, we're looking very much forward to hearing um, your presentation. Thank you. So, thanks Rasha for the uh, indication there to unmute myself. Um, I just want to begin by um, acknowledging that I'm also coming today from the lands of the Bidjigal people um, and that these lands were never unceded. And I'd like to acknowledge all the Aboriginal elders, past and present, who are here with us um, and also those who are in, um, in this seminar with us today. I'd like to acknowledge your ongoing relationship to land, culture and, uh, and to the oceans. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's the oceans and the seas that kind of brings to where I am today in wanting to talk about the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And what I really wanted to focus on wasn't the research I've done or the findings um, or the pertinent issues, but think of talk about a project, an activity that I've been trying to do over the last few years through COVID with many Pacific women um, scholars and colleagues across the region and really celebrate today their achievement to for many of them to be published for the first time to have had the courage to write their own thoughts and feelings um, into such a manuscript as the one here and often for those of you who work in the area of sexual and reproductive health and infectious diseases in the Pacific people often speak about the Pacific rather than from within the Pacific and this is a, a, a historical thing from missionaries anthropologists um, and the like. And so this whole project was very much designed that it was to be written from within the Pacific, where the voices and the values and the wisdom of the Pacific scholars themselves really took centre stage. And some of that can be seen even here in the design, which um, is actually from a mat of mine. And Throughout the Pacific, those of you who have been honoured to travel through the Pacific, live in the Pacific, tour in the Pacific, mats are a really central part of community life. And they're the places where the kinds of conversations that Sally was just talking about, contraception, trials, um, cultural leaders, these are where the communities come together to have these conversations. And they're it doesn't matter where the pundinus leave is from or where it's been um, beaten, chosen, coloured, woven together. They, they create um, a skill that, that the women that do these have a skill and they create designs and stories and, and they're sharing their own knowledges. And, and at the time that they're doing this, they come together for conversations and stories. And in parts of the Pacific, those stories are called talanoa, those conversations that don't have an end point. Oh, we want informed consent, not that type of end point. They're kind of conversations that are purposeful, meaningful and respectful with no end point other than we need to continue to have this conversation. And really this is what this book and this endeavour was about, is to start having a conversation that was being led um, by Pacific scholars. Um, and so whilst the book does focus on many of the problems that the Pacific faces, it really does also offer um, opportunities and thoughts. And so I just want to, um, oh, how do I, um, oh, so it brought together 33 women, um, including three gay men. Um, so the women were really supported um, throughout the Pacific. And these women are, some of them were more established scholars than others. Some of them were new to scholarship, but still had really pertinent activist type messages to share. Some of these women uh, scholars were living in the Pacific in their cultural homes, but many of them like um, we see here in Sydney and in New Zealand, were living in the diaspora and we didn't make a difference between who was living in the Pacific in their traditional cultural homes or who were still living within their cultural communities abroad. We brought together people with enduring 
um, learn meaningful relationships to Cook, um, Chuk, Samoa, Solomon Islands, PNG, Tonga, Fiji, and Niue. And so what we didn't want to do was to reinforce, you'll find often in Pacific scholarship, it's about Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia, and these are in and of themselves colonial constructs. And we wanted this to be an inclusive conversation where all regions were given equity um, and we allowed for the diversities of the histories of colonization, of voyaging, of Christianity, of violence, of cultural understandings around diverse genders, such as the Fafafini compared to Papua New Guinea, which doesn't have that type of tradition. So we really wanted to bring this region together as a whole. Um, and so that's reflected in part in this. Um, we have three sections to this book and they're really, to me, the core of what um, the issues that people were speaking to. And one is about young people, culture and education and trying to have these inter intergenerational conversations, particularly between older women and younger women. And, um, and I'm sure that people who have done work in the region, particularly around sexual and reproductive health, know that older women are often um, sometimes barriers to young people, particularly women, learning about their own body and their reproductive rights and experiences. So there were those conversations. It was also about how do you actually do sexuality education and sexual diversity education and gender diversity education in ways that are culturally appropriate. So it's not appropriate in some cultures from Polynesia, Samoa, Tonga in particular, to have brothers and sisters in the same classroom or cousins of opposite sex learning about these things together. So we heard stories about the policy implications for making sure that educations and school systems were responsive um, to the cultural needs. Um, and, and the other um, section, um, the second section, sorry, was around sexual and reproductive health and well-being. And we put well-being in there because often infectious diseases, it's about the risk or the adverse outcomes. But quality of life and well-being are also really important things um, in people's uh, women and men's sexual and reproductive life. So we really wanted to focus on well-being as well. And then the third section, which I think really speaks to a bit of the kind of Pacific wisdom and traditions around belongingness, connectedness and justice. Um, and those who have worked or, or had the privy, um, privilege to live in the Pacific know how um, decisions are not individual this individualized sense of human rights doesn't operate in the same way it does in a society like ours in Australia or in the United States. The community um, and your reciprocal rights and responsibilities are really important uh, and things like um, parson. So I just want to highlight, I know that there are so many other amazing women who are going to talk and, and so I don't want to take space from them as well, but I do want to highlight three women who I am just so proud of, who stood up and um, and put their voices into this book, because for me, the book is not the outcome, but it was the process that we did together. And for me, Yana, who is here, who's the beautiful um, Fijian woman uh, to the left with the, the flowers over her head, she is a young activist. She is not an academic. She's currently working in um, HR, um, but had some experience in counselling and psychology as an undergraduate and volunteered in some Fiji, in the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre. And she became a female activist um, there. And she really has taken on board trying to sit on that mat and have intergenerational conversations where she's bringing older women to talk with younger girls so that they can learn about their bodies, about relationships, about custom and about culture. And so she's really pushing that at the same time that she's also pushing the agenda around sexual violence is not part of Pacific culture. She's really trying to push and support new ways to support men. Um, and Interestingly, through her work, she's also trying to find ways to support women who have been the victims of sexual abuse. And sadly, that is a very common issue throughout the Pacific and it affects people's lives considerably. But she's trying to then engage with women who want to re-engage in meaningful sexual relationships. And so she's just really 
an inspiring young woman. She's not done a master's degree. She's not done an honours degree, but her chapter is so provocative. She's done these podcasts. She's into technology. She does tweets. She does infographics about everything. And I really want to celebrate Yana today because I think she is the future of the Pacific and other women are like her because they are not a burden. We talk here a lot about the youth bulge as a burden for the future of the Pacific. And I actually think they're a massive resource. And, um, and we talked a lot about that. And she too has started to see that, that they are part of the solution. The second amazing woman um, is an older woman and out of respect, um, I would call her Auntie Dorothy. But she's from the Solomon Islands and she is from a part of the Solomons where they really respect and value traditional ways of life. They have stopped um, bridges being built by Chinese uh, aid money. They continue to walk and dress in their traditional clothes. They have a very strong connection to land and ecological um, uh, justice and protecting their ecosystems. Those of you who um, have worked in the Pacific, uh, particularly in neglect of tropical disease, would know the McLarens. Uh, and this is their family area. Um, and Michelle um, supported Auntie Dorothy in leading this chapter. But it's Auntie Dorothy who is the real hero of this chapter because she, and whilst we have her story here in English, we do have her story in her language. And for me, as a, a mother of children whose father has a different language to mine, um, so it's not just mother tongue, but father tongue to me is really important. Language and culture are so intimately entwined. And so Dorothy's chapter actually starts in her language. And then we've tried to make that into um, something that's meaningful in English. But what she saw was young girls in distress returning home through these villages with blood stained uniforms, leaving school. And she saw that they didn't have proper sanitary hygiene, both in pads, there was also no toilets, there was no running waters in these schools. And so she has single-handedly started a group of women from her community to learn how to make reusable menstrual pads. She's helped to install running water in these schools so that the girls can wash their hands uh, and go to the toilet. Things that we take as standard issues of health and equity in our schools in Australia, you go and there's a menstrual, um, whatever those things are called, I'm not quite sure what they're called. I, I, if I was a hygienist, I would know. But they, they don't even have toilets to change. And then when they need to change, they need to have access to a plastic bag to put their dirty menstrual um, pad in and then go home and wash it. And you'll see here an image, it's actually of um, a traditional menstrual hut. This is how traditional this community is. And I'm not saying that to say in, in anything of other than they are an amazing cultural community that um, have customs. And they've tried to find ways that women can then clean and dry their now their reusable pads away from men so that they're not shamed. And whilst they didn't set this out to be a process of educational equity, it was really definitely an issue of health. But actually what Annie Dorothy and her colleagues and her women folk have done is actually address issues of educational inequality for young women and girls in this part of um, the Solomon Islands by addressing something so simple as having access to water, to a toilet and reusable pads. And the last woman I want to celebrate is um, a woman called Ruthie Neo. And Ruthie and I have worked together for 13 years. And she came as an undergraduate who had just or just finished her undergraduate degree at the University of PNG. And she has single-handedly become PNG's leading social researcher in issues of gender diversity. And these are three images from her chapter, which both looks at men who have sex with men or, or what they are more referred to in Papua New Guinea of men of diverse sexualities. Um, some of them may identify as gay, but most not, and transgender women. And these women 
uh, shared their life histories with Ruthie, histories about wanting to be a woman, the only person that we've met so far who's been privileged to have access to hormone therapy overseas um, with her breasts there and, and but taking pride in being a feminine woman and, and having her bras. And then um, another one of our trans sisters at the top who is holding a conch shell necklace. And this shell necklace for her was like a rosary bead that had been shared with her mother um, and that that gave her significant strength. She's also a woman living with HIV um, and she is herself trying to support other women uh, like her, including the young woman down below whose jewellery you can see. Um, every time I would meet her, she would always be asleep at the back of a conference room or a meeting hall because she's a working girl. And as a transgender woman who lives on the streets in Leh in Papua New Guinea, life is incredibly hard. And um, But she always prided herself in her jewellery and her connections to those who gave her those pieces of jewellery. And whilst they're the nice stories in themselves, it's Ruthie who really has been able to develop relationships as a scholar to sit with these hidden women in Papua New Guinea who often don't get heard or seen and whose narratives are not sitting in the museum as the narratives of other men are or maybe objects of other women such as Billums might be. These women are really remain hidden. And so I kind of today just want to take my opportunity to talk is to share I guess my praise and my appreciation of these women, but all the women um, who supported these women to write. So, you know, for example, in terms of this chapter, Jamie Newland, who's part of the Kirby Institute, she's worked really hard with Ruthie to become a Pacific scholar and to have this as her first first author chapter. And for those of you who have followed the issues in New Zealand about Pacific Islanders and Maori, there are really systemic issues about racial discrimination in academia in New Zealand. And so it's important for me as, um, a, a, as a woman who's been supported both by women and men to get to where I am, to take these opportunities such as, as this book to really foster women um, and to appreciate their diversity and equity and give them an opportunity to be, um, to be authors as well. Thanks, Tanya. And Thanks so much for that um, very empowering presentation and those personal stories, sharing the stories of the women that you highlighted there. Um, and it feels like your book has embodied lots of the conversations that we're hoping to draw on as well about the process of these conversations, ongoing conversations that need to be had. Um, so thank you, Ange. Thanks. Next, next, I'd really like to introduce Dr. Adrienne Lee Withall. Um, she's a combined track uh, researcher in ageing and mental health at the School of Psychology at the University of New South Wales. Uh, her, focuses, her research focuses on promoting cognitive health for marginalised and underserved populations such as older justice-involved people. She leads a substream on ageing at the margins at University of New South Wales Ageing Futures Institute, uh, where a focus of her research is equity and digital innovation in cognitive assessment. So Adrienne, welcome, um, and I'll hand over to you. Looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much for having me. And yeah, I'd just like to echo the thoughts of others to, um, to say it is an honor to be asked to speak here today. Um, it is a hard act to follow the two fantastic women that I've just had the pleasure of listening to, um, but I will give it a shot here. So I'm talking about my work here. Can I? Confirm that's gone into slideshow and all visible. Great. Okay. Um, so have you heard? Um, now I've I've spent many many years working in the school of, of psychiatry, and then I've I've worked in the school of population health, and I'm gradually moving down the campus, and now um, working in the school of psychology at um, UNSW. And I would also like to acknowledge that today I'm, I'm on the land of the Bidjigal people who occupy the Sydney coast. Um, I'm a saltwater woman myself. So um, through my mother's family, I'm a Wadi Wadi Wandi Wandian woman. And we're from the beautiful water um, of the Illawarra Shoalhaven region. So I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and, and present 
and also respect, um, extend my respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present here today and really everyone who's come to listen to the conversations that we're having with open hearts and minds. So um, I thought I would start, normally I can't get away with, with putting sort of personal touches into a talk, but I thought on, on this day, it was really important actually to share a bit of myself um, with people because I feel incredibly privileged in my life, um, privileged because of the family that I have. Um, but you can see this is the, the child that I started out. Um, this was me when I was little. And at this point in my life, all I wanted to be was Wonder Woman. So that, that was my aspiration. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find the, the image where I was dressed as Wonder Woman, but I would wear that around frequently. Um, and I think my biggest sort of privilege in my life has actually been receiving an education. Um, and receiving an education as a woman, because I have two beautiful parents that you can see here. Um, they were both World War II babies and neither of them received really an education. So my mother and my father were both forced to leave school when they were 14. Um, my mother went to work in the bank, even though she was sort of ducks of her school. Um, and probably if you met my mum, you'd know she could probably turn her hand to anything. Um, but my father as well had to leave school to go to an apprenticeship. And that was a sign of those times. My mum uh, ended up being an accountant and she absolutely loved her job, but she did the very traditional thing of leaving work um, to have a child. And my father thought that was the right thing at the time. And it's only in her later years did she say, well, I actually miss that occupation. I really, really miss my work. And it was just a different time. So when I actually went and um, graduated and not just did an honours degree, but also then went on to do a PhD and that's my graduation here. Um, not only was it my proudest day, I, I suspect it was probably theirs as well, um, but I was very privileged in being given that gift of uh, going to a state school, being taught to work really hard, finding what you love and working hard at it. Um, and actually the privilege of being able to live at home while I did that. And I think that that's something that I noticed being a combined track person, I teach as much as I do research. And I think there's a lot of students having taught for the last 11 years in the medical program that don't appreciate necessarily the, the privilege that comes with being at home and having an environment that fosters actually people to stay in school and to study um, and to excel. And I'll, I'll sort of come back to that later on. But I, I must admit, my dad came to Sydney University. I was very proud because he studied acoustics and engineering when he was in his 50s. I remember saying to him, Dad, you're not sitting in the front row, are you? And he went, I can. I can't see if I sit further back than that. But um, it was my mum, actually, that was the driving force in making him go to night school and um, actually making him go and, and do this course. So my mum is definitely the glue that, that keeps us all together. So a lot of my research is, has occurred in the, the mental health and the dementia space, and I've worked clinically um, as well. And I have to say, it's... Uh, a funny dynamic, I've worked a lot in clinical trials, and I think what all of that clinical trial experience told me, and this sort of harks back to things that Sally was saying, um, all the people that we always take through to dementia trials are very clean populations. Uh, you may have one lacoon in your brain scan, but you cannot have two. Uh, you must score within these parameters. You must have no drug and alcohol uh, use history to be able to participate in clean trials. And I always felt that there was a lot of people that were locked out um, from research. So even though when we're thinking about dementia, it's very much something which is, is acknowledged to be uh, an older woman's condition. So a lot of people go, oh yes, it's just something because older women live longer, they're more prone to actually having a neurodegeneration later in life. Um, but I had an interesting moment a few years ago. I was giving one of the plenaries at the Alzheimer's Disease International Conference. And it's a wonderful conference because we have about three, well, for that one, it was three and a half thousand people. It was happening in Japan, um, one of, a, a place that I very much enjoy going to. Um, and we have a lot of consumers who attend that conference. So it's not just academics. It's people who have a lived experience of dementia in their family members who turn up. Now, I was, uh, I think, the only female keynote speaker, perhaps for that, or, or one of 
very, very small minority. I was certainly the only one that went to the formal welcome function at an event where nobody spoke to me, um, which was a bit disconcerting. But the other thing that, that happened that really sort of made me think was that the professor who was from Japan who spoke before me, and we were talking about young people with dementia, which is my specialty, was talking about how dementia when it comes on young for women is not really that much of a problem because the woman still has the house to look after and she can keep up those duties through her life. But for the man, for the man who loses his job, loses his role, for him it is such a massive loss of self-esteem that really we should always be looking to apply our efforts towards men with dementia rather than women. And I know that my jaw dropped um, sitting there and I kept it together to give my talk, but it really surprised me. And, and I do acknowledge that we do have a lot of diversity in views and different ways of living all around the world. But it, I thought, huh, is that really the way over here in Japan or do we maybe just not ask the question? And it sort of got to that notion of thinking about women really as one of those invisible populations. So what is it that, that's happening when we think about women? Um, are they really invisible? Or sometimes is it that we don't know what's going on for women because we're just not seeing them in certain places? Are we not looking for them? And certainly that's true um, in the work that I've done in marginalised populations. I've, I've worked a lot with people who are having uh, drug and alcohol use issues. Um, that's a population where we're seeing more women than ever before, particularly middle-aged women um, who, are, who are misusing drugs and alcohol. Um, so we're having to shift our approach because, again, it's not the population we expect to see. In the prison, we're seeing more women than ever before. And in homelessness health services, we also have what keeps being referred to as this invisible population of women. Um, but I can't help but think that we're really not so invisible, are we? Um, and if you, fair enough, if we, we think about who's the face of homelessness, we often do think of the down on his luck man, you know, the man that sort of um, had this face of poverty, um, had a rough trot and he's sleeping rough, but increasingly we're actually seeing this person as the face of homelessness. So older women who are aged over 55 are actually the fastest growing demographic. And we've just got a, a paper that's coming out at the moment, which is looking at accelerated aging in people who are experiencing homelessness. And we did want to look at whether or not there was a gender effect, what's going on for women. And we've written a review paper, which is still in, in the works on the experience of, of women um, who are homeless. And there's really not enough data to make much of it. And it's sort of that, that question remained of, is it that we really aren't doing research that grabs women? Are we not asking the right questions? Are we not going to where women are? Why is it that we don't even know enough about women? Although we keep seeing the headlines about women being this growing group. And we know that, that women who are homeless do have a very different experience of homelessness. There's a, a greater representation of, of women who have mental illness, greater trauma histories, and certainly uh, interpersonal violence is a very big factor for them then. Um, but surely in a respect to knowing where women are coming from, we must be prepared to receive them in health services. It can't just be this vision blindness. So here's some data that we, we did looking at the change in the prisoner population over time. And we actually modeled ABS data and we were looking from just the last 15 years, because everyone was referring to the graying of the prison population, that it's rapidly aging. And sure enough, it actually is. And a lot of people said, oh, isn't it just general population aging? Um, no, it isn't. And that's what you can see here, right? The, the prison population is growing, the older population, at a much farther, faster rate than anyone is aging in the general population. But here's the really interesting one. If we actually look at what's going on and we break that into differences, not just by age group, but actually we look at sex differences, you can see here that pretty much at most of, you know, bar, bar one um, of these age groups on this graph, we're actually seeing a much faster rise in women who are ending up in prison than in men. And it's really, really pronounced in women who are over the, the age of 65. Now, even though the net number is small, 
um, the percentage is quite significant. And when we actually looked at what was going on um, for much older women, we found that a, a very big driver was um, data coming out of Northern Territory. And unfortunately, a, a very, very dramatic increase in the number of older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women who are going to prison. Um, now, this isn't an isolated data that we're seeing here. This is something that we're seeing around the world. Um, likewise, in Japan, they actually have what they call an epidemic of older people going to prison, and particularly older women who are going to prison because they're feeling lonely uh, and isolated and trying to avoid homelessness. So we're seeing a lot of the same, you know, issues that are coming around. Um, as I said, it's, it's not just an isolated thing. So we um, proposed to actually start doing some research. And what we're looking at is um, how can we make a difference? And this research called Escape, which has been funded by an NH and MRC Ideas Grant, actually came out from a, a little seed, a little idea. And we were wondering, given that the clients that we were working with in drug and alcohol services were actually really interested in their brains and interested in their brain health, because they were responding well to the fact that we were testing them and they were asking for help. Well, what can I do to improve my brain health? And that surprised us a bit because there's always an assumption that um, for people who come through drug and alcohol services, um, that they're not invested in their treatment and they don't turn up because they don't want things to get better. Actually, when we spoke to people and said, why, you know, is, did you not want to sign up for this cognitive rehabilitation project? They said to us, it's because it takes a very big chunk out of my day. You're running the program for three hours in the morning. I'm trying to get my life back on track. And yet you're wanting me to come back in and take half a day out of my week when I'm trying to get a job. That's really, really hard. So we started to think about what we could do in a mobile sense to help people do rehab where they were. And so that's sort of the idea of where escape's grown from, which is, well, then how can we help people with digital devices actually in the prison context? And we've been conducting focus groups um, with older people in prison and with a real focus on older women in prison since there's just so little information known about older women in prison. And I tell you what, um, the, the women have just been so insightful, so honest, so pragmatic, um, about life circumstances, how they are, where they are, working together as a group. And it feels as though we are genuinely giving a voice to women in things that we can do to improve their health, not just while they're in prison, but after they leave it as well. And one of the things that they said to us um, when we talked to older women and men about their health, they, they reported much the same things, such as sleep. Sleep in prison is diabolical. You get locked into your room at 3.30 in the afternoon. You get woken up extraordinarily early in the morning. There's noises all through the night. Um, so sleep, it didn't matter. But a, a particularly poignant thing, um, which I had never considered, was how to go through menopause in prison. What happens when you're forced to sleep on rubber mattresses, like this one, this is from a picture from Silverwater, which is where uh, one of the women's prisons are. Um, and what happens when you're sweating uncontrollably at a night of a night time with no ventilation on that mattress? And women just said, we just don't sleep. And we don't sleep from a very specific thing which affects us as women. And we don't know what to do about that, but gee, it'd be nice. It, it's nice the fact that you're listening and hearing. And we feel as though there's a chance to, to maybe be heard in this. And the other interesting things that, are, that came up in these focus groups really brings us back to some of the information. And, and I apologise, I, I have used this is from one of my students, Rhys Mantel, who just had this work published, PhD student. Um, first time we've ever had a paper published without any corrections or revisions um, from a journal. Um, and the thing that really um, made sense to us was this is sort of the education piece. And you can see there, uh, this is one of the images from Gray's Invaders, which is the brain game that we built in drug and alcohol services. And we showed them what it looked like. And people in prison said, well, it's a bit childish, really. One person said, I've seen better graphics on a Commodore 64. Um, 
And the, the net result was, why are you actually making it things so easy for us? It feels like you're dumbing it down. And it feels like you're making assumptions about who we are as people. And a lot of the women wanted word games. They wanted to be stretched. They wanted to actually have the extension. There's a diverse population in prison. Um, there's no one person who ends up in prison. So they actually wanted these challenges. And I, there was a really fabulous um, comment that's, that's in, in this case, it was a gentleman who made it. I was in rehab 40 years ago. A couple of the blokes complained that it was a complex program for simple people, and it should have been a simple program for complex people. And where this all comes back to is not making assumptions and actually asking the people who are the experts in their own health. Um, because as I said, we would never have known any of the information about a woman's experience in prison if we hadn't actually gone and asked the women and involved them in designing the tools for them. So lack of education, I think, is a really important barrier to good health. Um, but please don't assume that people are illiterate when you're actually working with marginalised populations, because most of the women that we had in our groups, um, they had work jobs and they were trained in, in using computers. And we went in assuming that there would be a different level uh, of competency. And that was my naivety. And I own that um, today. So... I think the other thing that we've learned is in working with um, people and particularly working with women is focusing on strengths. I think often we focus on deficits and perhaps don't, again, empower people. I've been told empowerment is not a fashionable word at the moment, but I believe it's an excellent word. Um, the experience of being told you can. Now, this is to bring it back full circle. I have a son and a daughter. My son's pretty awesome too, but my daughter since this is uh, International Women's Day, her aspirations in year one were to fly on a unicorn, be a princess and help people and be happy. And she's my little um, social justice warrior. So I know that my education has actually benefited her. My education, for, through being an educated woman, I've actually opened doors for my children. Um, the things that they, the conversations they get included in, the knowledge about the world is incredible. And again, I think we need to respect that education is really diverse. When we, and I, I think that's what we've heard from the previous two speakers, is not always relying, you know, there was a comment, oh, she, she's not, so hasn't gone to university, but she's an advocate. Life experience is education. Um, it's not just book smarts. It's actually knowing your way around. Everyone has something of value. Um, women should have a voice in their own care and making decisions um, about their own care. They should not feel invisible. So um, my daughter went as uh, Glinda the Good Witch for her last ever book parade in year six last year, which I think is a really good fit for her. Um, but I actually think she's more like Princess Leia. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that just from the fact that I started out as a kid with no expectation of having an education, that I can pass that on and sort of help some of the students also realise the privilege that they have in their education and their role to make, make a change to the world. That's me. Adrian, thank you so much for that presentation and, and for sharing your personal stories, which I believe they're, they're the ones that resonate most and, and really help people understand perspective. So I appreciate you taking the time um, and the opportunity to share all of those with us. Um, we'll get back to this and questions popping up in the chat, but again, we'll, we'll bring those to the end. So now I'd like to introduce our final speaker, Professor Janaki Amin. Um, she's course director for the Master of Public Health and is a visiting professorial fellow at the Kirby Institute. And she's also, in her spare time, Director of Epi Epidemiology, Data and Systems at New South Wales um, Ministry of Health. She's an infectious disease epidemiologist working across clinical trials, cohort studies, and the analysis of routinely collected population data. Uh, she has a particular interest in public health impact in priority populations. So Janaki, uh, welcome, and very much here, looking forward to hearing your perspective from an educational point of view. 
Thanks for your kind introduction. Um, so today I sit in the offices of the Ministry of Health, located on the unceded lands of the Kamaragal people, traditional custodians of this land and part of the greater Eora nation. I pay my respects to elders past, present, and expect extend that respect to all First Nations people with us. As with all the other speakers, it's such fine talent to be um, a part of today. I was honoured to be asked to speak in this conversation. Many of you know me, have spent a large number of years as part of the Kirby family. Some would argue once you're part of the Kirby, you never get a chance to leave. And so in a way, I'm speaking at a family gathering, which can feel like a warm embrace or sometimes feels a bit like a bun fight. So we'll see which way it goes today. Um, part of my excitement and anticipation was hearing the rich and diverse stories of my co-presenters who have given us amazing insights into the work that they've done. They've given voice to the constraints, strengths and ingenuity of women accessing healthcare in many communities across the globe and the barriers that have been overcome. This too made me a bit hesitant, these fine women, these fine researchers, after all, what could I bring to this conversation? Coming to the Kirby is where I'm returning to the place where I developed my research skills, specifically in data analysis. So when I'm in doubt, I dive into the data. However, as part of this invitation, I was briefed organizers were not meant to be doing data heavy presentations. Sorry, what did you say? I have no safety net now. So here I am entering new professional territory, sharing my personal experiences and my reflections. And yes, this is starting to feel a bit more like one of my family dinners. So as an aside, and to give you a flavor of my family, I'm gonna share with you a photo of my mother. Um, and thank you, Adrian, for also sharing some of your family stories. Um, so Elaine, if you could share that photo. Thank you. So this is a photo of my mum, who was a nurse. And these photos were taken at a polio clinic in Nairobi in 1966. So this was mum's beginning of her career. And as I said, our family lunches can be quite, um, they can be quite energetic and robust. And at our last Sunday lunch, mum was telling us of her stories working at the endocrine clinic at Prince of Wales Hospital, supporting the trans community in Sydney in the 1980s. Quite a remarkable journey from a young woman in Nairobi in the 1960s to Sydney in the 1980s. Really, truly, honestly, she should be giving this presentation. But you're stuck with me, so here I go. When I applied for my pos first position at the Kirby Institute, which was then Encheka, I was six months pregnant. I was distinctly aware that this could be problematic. The position I was applying for was a one year contract and maternity leave during that time was going to have significant impact. As is my way prior to doing anything, I have to talk to people. So I rang the person who was hiring for the position and during the conversation, I disclosed that I was pregnant. My intention being, if this is gonna be a problem, find any way you can to exclude me before we even go down this road. They obviously didn't take that route and I was offered the position. This at that time would have been considered the gold standard for employer. I did learn subsequently that there was consternation about my employment while I was pregnant and how that would impact on the work that I was going to be doing. Up to that point, to my knowledge, I don't think any female employee at Encheka had taken parental leave. I took the job. And after sharing an office with Greg Dorr for a few months, who assured me of his obstetric skills in case of emergency, which thankfully I didn't need, I safely gave birth to my second daughter and I returned to work. I wonder today if a person who is pregnant would approach the position with the same hesitancy that I did and feel the same need to disclose, or if an employer would feel the same consternation 
would they be hesitant at hiring a person who was coming in and had disclosed they were pregnant? A few years later, I attended a strategy day for the Kirby, to which many esteemed guests had been invited. I was still a fairly junior researcher at this time, and was flattered to be joined during lunch by quite a senior man who was a clinician, an academic, and had been a politician. He was very well respected and played a significant role in the government response to HIV. He asked me what I wanted my legacy to be. I was flustered by the question. I had no answer. Afterwards, I felt like I had failed a test. Could I not be a successful academic if I wasn't planning to have a legacy? More recently, I saw an interview with Helena Bonham Carter, and she was asked by an interviewer what a biographer would say about her work. And her response was, I've done other stuff, which is more interesting. I've been a mother. I've done things between people and enabled things to happen. They've been much more interesting and important than my pretending to be someone else. The interviewer took umbrage at what she said. No, he says, don't do that. There has to be a point where women say, no, I matter and my career matters. On hearing this, she looked a bit diminished and she acquiesced. I thought, or perhaps I shouted at the television at this point, you asked her a question, you dismissed her answer and you invalidated her response. It made me think back to that conversation with the politician so long ago. What answer would have satisfied him, allowed him to judge me as worthy? And who has the right to decide what each of us finds significant in our own lives. For us and those we work with and engage with, often the incidental, the way in which we do work is what is important and valuable and makes the job worth doing. Perhaps it's time for the matrix to change. In recent times, impact has joined the constellation of what we call the, mat the metrics in academia. What else should we consider to be important? Are the things only valuable if we can metrify them? I would think not. 16 years after being at the Kirby, I moved to the Macquarie University to establish the Master of Public Health course. It was a very different environment with very different work. Here, the team I work with is predominantly women and at least half of the load for all of us is in teaching with 60 to 70% of our students being women. The pace is defined by the teaching calendar and it's less reactive than research demands. Times of high workload are known and slow, slower times can be scheduled. Staff have ongoing or at least longer term contracts and are not living with ongoing uncertainty. Job sharing at the ministry is very common and both at the ministry and at Macquarie, part-time work is not unusual. I don't know for sure, but from what I hear, this is very different from many environments in which there is a greater prevalence in men. It could be argued that this security and flexibility enables gendered roles in private lives particularly around childcare, parental care, and other workload, homework um, to be maintained. I would argue that yes, these structures do enable additional caring responsibilities, but that does not mean that that workload has to be gendered. As in all teaching institutions during COVID, our team at Macquarie had a rapid shift to online learning. I'm sure we've all heard many conversations about the impact of COVID on teaching. But one of the things that really resonated with me over this time was the graciousness and thanks that we received from our students. They acknowledged our work in delivering the content, but also the pastoral care that they received. We had instances of disclosure of domestic violence, inability to access healthcare, and significant mental health issues, all of which the staff helped students navigate. 
This care for our students and each other was critical over this time. Care happens not only in our home environments, but also in our workplaces. Also over the last two years, I started working with the Commonwealth and New South Wales Departments of Health. I had an interesting experience with my first meeting held at the Department of Health. I didn't know any of the participants in this meeting. It was an online meeting, but it was unique for me. When I or others contributed to the conversation, there was an acknowledgement and a building of ideas. The meeting was a true collaborative effort, not dominated by the loudest voice. Perhaps it was because of the shared common goal or a cultural difference in the way of you working, but the way of communicating was different. I clocked someone say, as Janaki said, and then they went on to, de develop, to de develop the idea that we were talking about. People were not just wanting to say their piece. They were there to share and to contribute. This happened frequently at the meetings in this, um, in this context, not just as a one-off. It sounds really simple, but it was a true demonstration of allyship and an, an amplification of the voices of others. It was also a bit disheartening for me as I noticed it was not the norm in all of the meetings that I attend. This allyship and elevation, I now see my older daughter experiencing. She has recently commenced a graduate traineeship at the Department of Health. Her first descriptions of her work, other than being insanely excited by what she was doing, were for her to describe her intake cohort. And I'll give you a little bit of context. She's working in the data stream across health, across um, government sectors. All of her cohort are women. And the team in which she works in within the department are equal numbers of men and women. And her third descriptor was to say that two thirds of the people were people of color. All of these things quite interesting to me in how she chooses to describe her work environment. The other thing she said was that she was really pleased that her boss was a woman. I asked her why that pleased her and she says because I know she had to fight to get to that position. Most of the positions of power in this organization are held by men. Interesting, I thought, and responded to her. Perhaps your boss did or did not need to compete against men for that particular position. But you know that she worked very hard and is comp competent and is the best person for the job. And as Shivali has described her working relationship with this woman, more importantly than anything else, I can see that she is found to be competent herself and her boss sees her. I value that. And I am so pleased that she's in a position that she is valued as well. I've had the pleasure and the privilege of working with many competent, kind and courageous women and our allies who strive to create environments in which we can all not only succeed, but flourish. Thank you for letting me share my experiences. Oh my, thank you, Janaki. <laughs> um, and thank you to all of our presenters. I was just wondering perhaps if you'd like to put your cameras on and take your mics off mute. I'm actually a little bit um, overwhelmed by all of that, to be honest, in terms of there are so many strong themes um, and such important concepts there to pull together actually in 15 minutes, which is, is unfortunately the only time that we have remaining. Um, I do see there are some conversations that are questions that have come up that have, may have, have often some of them have been answered already in the chat, but I'll perhaps touch on those. But one that um, I was just really struck me was, Angela, your book, as an example, for me, sort of actually embodied a lot of the themes we're talking about here, which was that concept of inclusion and um, the full circle of conversation, that never ending conversation that we should never um, 
end the learning process, never end that conversation, never make assumptions. Um, and how important that conversation was in the education of ourselves and other people. So I was actually going to try and flip it around and, and bring it back to one of the first um, discussion points that Sally you, you, and many of you have drawn on, which is around the, the importance of um, having that conversation early on and the importance of education among not just the people you're working with, but perhaps that full consultation process from the community and elders and the families and the individuals themselves. Um, Sally, I was just wondering, I don't know if you've come across this or this, this part of your um, experience, how important do you think, and from a research perspective as well, this is probably my, my own um, taint on it, how important do you think it is that that education process is also part um, of a conversation with our funders or the government organisations? Because one of the, the things that I've found is that this consultation, this education, the value that's placed on that is not necessarily understood by um, everyone. And particularly funders who, if you're looking to um, support a project, we're saying, oh, we want outcomes by in 12 months and we want X, Y, and Z. How important is it that we also continue that consultation education process for funders to understand the value of um, these conversations and that they're ongoing conversations? I think it's very important. And I actually think you have to build in the time for the relevant conversations to happen and be very clear about why things take the time that they do to justify why you need coverage over the duration of a project that you actually build in sufficient time for. But firstly, um, contributions to a, a clinical protocol, which I've found in the past what we used to do was we would submit a protocol and there may be changes to the informed consent forms and things like that, but people didn't usually ask unless they had a real problem with the protocol itself for changes to the protocol. But in the global health setting, I found that every ethics committee wants certain things added to the protocol. Mm -hmm. The regulator, regulator also is, wants to see everything in the protocol in great detail, which was not my previous experience. And that all takes time because you've got to do all those iterations, the sequential process. And then it is the process of engaging with communities through the investigators and their team, um, all the local medical communities, health, everyone. It's got, uh, it's got, it's like a you drop a, a, um, a pebble in the middle, and you've got to engage everyone, no matter how close to the actual participant they are. Mm. Um, the whole community, the medical healthcare system, and the like, all have to be brought on board, and that all takes quite a long time, which I hadn't appreciated before I started to work in the global health space. So I think it is super important we communicate that with people who need to know and, and funders understand that as part of the funding request. Thanks, Sally. Um, we've got a, a question that's come up that's reflecting on Sally's presentation, also Angela's. I'll just speak to that at the moment. Um, of having the opportunity of working in settings that may be more conservative than our upbringing in terms of the role of women and how much open power, oh, sorry, open power they may have in their communities. How do you navigate those tensions? Do you see them also as opportunities to potentially contribute to more equitable communities where you work, Susanna? Susanna, I'm not sure that I've done justice to your question. I'm very happy for you to take yourself off mute if you'd like to, <laughs> if you're in a position to, of course. That's okay. Um, so then one of the other questions that I had was actually um, that, that involvement, and I, I, it was a that conversation, ongoing conversation that we're speaking about, that you touched on, Adrian, which is regards to the assumptions that we often make. Um, are, are you, do you have any... Um, examples of research that you've done or consultations or projects that you've been involved in where an assumption that you came into um, that project was completely flipped and completely changed your perspective, your approach to a project, perhaps it would be in prisons or, um, or homeless communities as, as an example. I think you might continue. Yeah, I don't think so. One is how invested and and how much support people who have cognitive issues as well as I would go about with these. Um, 
I'm just having trouble hearing you, Adrian. Sorry, it's just a bit break, breaking up a little bit. I'm not sure if. Now, is that any better? A little bit better, yeah. Thanks, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, look, to be honest, it was. Sorry. There we go. Um, yeah. uh, uh, are others having trouble hearing um, Adrian? Sorry. Um, Why are we trying to get Adrian back? Do you want yeah. me to try and talk about Susanna's? Yeah, please go ahead. And sorry, you probably, I, I feel like I didn't address the question very well. So please go ahead, Angela. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Look, I think um, I think it's really important to always recognise that, and I know this might sound really simple, but just because a community is different to yours doesn't mean yours is the right way to view women's rights and education and roles and responsibilities. And I think it's about um, it's fine about the Susanna getting the wording right because I think it's a it's an important question, but it is about being really critical of your own cultural background first and the power and the abuse of power that even as a Caucasian woman, I can have over Papua New Guinean women. Um, so, cause not all women are equal in particular spaces. Here in Sydney, it might be different, but in Papua New Guinea, when I'm working there and in a village, my relationship to community is very different than a Papua New Guineans woman. And I think it's also the only way to address and support communities to reflect and come to decisions themselves is to have a really conscious, um, like Paolo Freire, the Brazilian um, educator from all those years ago, talks about conscientization where you have to become critical of your own learning and your own process. And, and I think that's really important when you are going into the communities that we often go in with a preconceived outcome of what something should be and that this is the way consent should be done. A woman, for example, shouldn't be having a man consent over her ability to have contraception or things like this. And I think it's about spending more, for me, the issue is about spending more respectful time in community to understand how they deal with their positionality because it's not sometimes cultural in a um, being a wadi wadi woman, for example, or being a kawapi woman or a huli woman. It might be other issues like Christianity. And I think these are sometimes in the Pacific um, and I, because I'm conscious that you work in the Pacific, Susanna and other people have referred to the Pacific. I think Christianity is a really important overlay throughout the Pacific that is woven like the mat. It is woven throughout and it's become so localised that it's almost traditional. And yet Christianity is an act of colonisation. And and, but interestingly for today, it often bought medicine as well. Christian, Christian missionaries also bought medicine. Um, and they still perform much of the medical care in the region through faith-based um, services. So I, I think it's about giving time and, and really not actually having the answer. And it's really hard, I think, to go into a community and honestly, genuinely not have the answer and listen. And, and because women can negotiate power, but they may not also do it in the same way that we do it and we can recognize here. But that's a very short answer to something that's really complicated. Oh, I can imagine we could, um, there's lots of things to unpack, Angela, within that and many of the questions and topics that have raised today. I'm really, really sad that we only have a short time to discuss all of this. Adrian, I'm not sure if you're able to speak now, um, if we can hear you, but it, it, it similarly touches on some of the concepts Angela was just mentioning about assumptions going into a study. I think, um, can you hear me now? It's a bit crackly, no. No, okay. Go, um, go ahead, I think it's a getting there. Yep, go ahead. We'll try. Um, okay, I, well, and one of the experiences I have had, and it, it popped up in a question that I asked in the chat about, you know, how did you deal with um, what appeared to be like sexism in, in the talk of Japan? Um, and it is, yes, 
going into the very area of mind when you're working in communities. So I was working, doing some work on mental health, particularly around young people in Indonesia. And they invited me over and had an idea on how to approach it. They wanted me to come as like the expert bringing the answers. And I was saying, I'm really uncomfortable in that. I don't know how you live. I don't know where your people live. I don't know. I can't tell you where to place the service without knowing the places where people hang out. So I actually got them to drive me around and we went and we ate and, you know, food and lived, you know, with the people. And then eventually I said, oh, I think a headspace kind of locating a service within a cultural centre would work for you. And they went, oh, well, you've actually come without any preconceived notions, just a whole lot of ideas, just an openness to try and embed something in the way people live rather than imposing. Thanks, Adrian. Um, Janika, I was also going to ask you a question. It's kind of a bit tangential to what you mentioned you were discussing, but it relates to Sally's um, mention and something that has been touched on throughout, in that in the fields that we might are currently working in, whether it be medicine or public health or infectious diseases or biomedicals, that it's it's actually there's a large number of women that sort of gravitate particularly to those areas. Um, and I, I really liked, Sally, your 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 take on that as a strength. It's actually a strength. So we can use this sort of in those positions as women in these roles to um, increase the visibility and, and in that respect. Janike, I was wondering in the education, um, I imagine this is a similar stream that you have in working at Macquarie University. Perhaps it was a little bit different at the Ministry of Health, but in the university sector, uh, is there is is it a good thing? Is it a problem? Is it um, something that we use as a, a very good strength? Um, the fact that I imagine many women gravitate to medicine, and my understanding, and public health as well. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. Um, we have in in our course, I think, is happening across the state, probably across the country. The intake of um, women into medical courses is about sixty percent women coming into as undergrads and postgrads into medicine as well as into public health. Um, I think there, there is so much space still to be gained by increasing representation of women across various workforces and as Shivali still clocked you might have entire bodies of women coming into the workforce but there are still many spaces in where in which the positions of power are held by men. Um, as all of us work in, what we really want to achieve is to encourage diversity in all its forms, all its aspects, and ensure that people feel safe and included in those spaces. Um, so whether I think it's, it's about building that capacity and however it plays out, it can play out. There are some spaces where I think there is very much space for um, encouraging quotas, for in, for example, in our political world, <laughs> um, and, and ensure oh representation in those spaces. We still see the eternal scissorographs in academic, academia of women coming in. I think there is a lot of space in which we want to talk about our societies and caring roles and those hope, the load that happens in the, the home and encouraging all parties to be able to share in all of the aspects of life, regardless of their gender. Well, thank you, Janaki. So I know that I have four A4 paper full of questions that I would love to ask and to flesh out with you all, but unfortunately we have reached the end of the session. Um, but I would very much like to thank the audience for, for joining. We had a fantastic turnout and to our presenters for um, joining us today and also for the people in the background organising. So Bridget, um, the Kirby Equity and Kirby Equity Diversity Inclusion Committee, plus all the comms teams in the background making it all work seamlessly. Um, thank you again for your time and for sharing with us your personal stories in particular and giving us a lot to think about on International Women's Day. Um, and we'll see you again next year. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Tanya.